alumni or a current student from an MBA program, you can talk to any of us about getting into a program. And so to start us off, I want to introduce Carol. She's a member of our leadership team. She's going to introduce our speaker tonight. So everyone, let's give it up for Carol. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you everyone for being here. Happy Cinco de Mayo. I'm glad that we all got to come out and enjoy some festivities today. Um, it's really my honor to present Sally Sirak to you tonight. I had the pleasure of, see, of listening to Sally speak last spring at a leadership summit, and I was really just stunned by her brilliance and her grace, and I thought of her many times over the year. And when it came time to choose a leader to speak about adaptability, Sally was a natural choice. So our theme tonight, as you probably read, is adaptability. And Sally really personifies adaptability. Um, when I look back at her educational as well as her professional experience, there's adaptability all throughout that. She has a background like a colorful, rich tapestry with, with, that's really um, got a lot of diverse patterns, but it's woven together with many threads of adaptability. Sally has four degrees. Four degrees. She has a Bachelor of Science in Business that she earned from the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee, a Bachelor of Arts in Fashion and Merchandising that she earned from the American College in London. She also has a Bachelor of Science in Retail and Merchandising Management from the University of Wisconsin Stout. And the crown jewel, her Master's of Arts, um, is in Integral Psychology, and she earned that from John F. Kennedy University. Um, her career path is equally as diverse. She has worked in the high fashion industry in London and New York City. Um, she's worked in the design and the construction management industry also. Um, she has written for parenting magazines, and she's published her own book. She's been on book tours. She's no stranger to the microphone. <laughs> and she's currently president of the direct-to-consumer at Virginia Dare Winery and, of course, Francis Ford Coppola. Um, just a few more words about Sally. Um, Sally really adapts from her role as a writer, um, as I mentioned before, from parenting magazines and her own books to really being a fierce yet graceful leader to hundreds of people. And Sally mentioned to me that she's really as proud of the fact that she's led three people as much as she's led 300 people. And she approaches that with a, an element of humility that I think we'll, we'll um, hear about. So she's lived in many different places. She's raised two beautiful children. She's got two high maintenance cats that keep her on her toes. <laughs> and um, you know, all of this really contributes to her ever evolving and staying adaptable. So please join me in welcoming Sally. really gutsy thing today and come up here and just stare at you for a little while. <laughs> See how that would feel <laughs> to you and to me. <laughs> Probably worse for me. <laughs> and the reason was to exemplify observing and how uncomfortable it is. I think how uncomfortable it is in our personal lives Hence the go, go, go. I mean, how many of you, and you're sitting in a restaurant with a friend and they get up to go to the restroom, you pull out your phone, mm -hmm. don't look around, <laughs> don't take anything in, be busy. And how many people in your organizations just pause and sit at your desk, lean back, take a nap like they do in Mad Men, I envy them, <laughs> have a drink. I can do that. I work in the wine business. Um, and think. And just think. I think back to um, my childhood and my brother. I'm one of six kids, and we'll get to that with adaptability in a minute. But he would um, be sitting on his bed, just tossing the ball in the air and catching it. And I'm the one who ran three clubs, you know, and I was a cross country, hated it, but I did it. Please, my dad, another story. You know, I was always busy, busy, busy. And he could just sit there and toss this ball 
up in the air and catch it over and over and over. I'm like, what are you doing, Andy? He's like, I don't know, just thinking. And I gotta tell you, he's the smartest young man that I know. He's incredible. He works in finance, he's always observing, and he's looking for patterns all the time. But observing is really uncomfortable. So a little audience interaction. If you were to attach another word to observing, what word comes to mind for you? Stalking. Stalking? <laughs> this is good. What? Judging. Judging, that was mine too. Hmm? Study. Yep. What else? Staring. Staring. Listening. Listening. Okay, observing is listening. Intrusive. Gathering. Obtrusive. It's uncomfortable, right? It's awkward. Awkward's a good one too. Ever been at a party and everyone's busy mingling? If you're in the 70s dancing, you know, um, having drinks, and there's that one person sitting on the sofa just looking? We hate that! <laughs> Watch people walk up to that person to try to engage them. Stop observing! We don't know what you're seeing. But that's what adaptability comes from. When that person goes home and everyone goes back to recap, who's got the better picture of what was going on in that room? He can tell you who's dating who, who wants to date who, who's in a fight, you know? And probably listen to a lot of interesting stories that no one else is picking up on. They're probably a great writer today. Filmmaker, maybe. Writer. Writer. <laughs> we're, we're sitting on the sofa right now. So. Uh, <laughs> I'll be on your book tour. Um, but observing is really uncomfortable, but that's where we do our learning, and that's, that's, it's courageous. If I were to think about adaptability in the stream of things, I'd say it's in line with innovation somewhere, right? But we think innovation just kind of poof happens. I think innovation is a result of observing and being willing to adapt. And being willing to adapt means giving up something, too. You have to give something up. You've got to give up your story. You want it? Are you getting a microphone here, Al? Oh, and I'm such a pacer. This is going to be torture. I don't want to go in and out. That's not fun. I'll just pivot. And you pivot with me. I'll get my fidgets out that way. Oh, God. OK, I'm going to make this work. I was meant to be Italian, so that. Um, but it's uncomfortable in that we have to question that if we really observe. So when I think about adaptability, and I promise by the end, this is going to be so tired of this word, but you're going to be so deep into this word. <laughs> you're going to make it like, adaptability. I, I have this weirdest dream about adaptability. Like, what does that mean? But adaptability is um, a process. And so I mentioned being one of six kids. If you were to look at your history, like Carol so eloquently described mine, and within that would be like gutsy and ignorant with some of the moves I made. But that's part of adaptability too. I'm like, when I picked up and moved to New York, I knew no one. I had a friend of a friend I could stay with. It was right out of college. And I um, had this grand idea. I'm going to go work in like the top retail store with the number one training program in the United States. Because I just think I can do that. Before internet. <laughs> Weird. Right? <laughs> I had to go through microfiche to do my research on the company. <laughs> and they wouldn't take an interview with me before I got there. Um, so I had to wait to go there, roll the dice, I could get in. So it was them, Abraham and Strauss and Macy's was what I was going after. So it really, um, gosh, I don't know who would play me at this point, but it probably could be a movie for how ridiculous it was, really. Because <laughs> so I packed my brother's army duffel bag and a Garmin bag for my really lame Midwestern looking suits I think I interview in. And I went out there, and, and I ended up getting the job I wanted. And actually got an offer from Macy's, too. But in my great, great maturity, I chose Abraham and Strauss because they had more vacation time. <laughs> like four weeks, because like this whole thing about working it was like crazy. So we all have adaptability somewhere in our history. So think back to your history. Could you even be childhood? I mean, starting there, did you pick up and move anywhere? Did you change schools? We all changed schools. At some point, you'd still be in your elementary school, right? <laughs> you moved houses, you moved neighborhoods, you moved communities. Adaptability is in you somewhere. But it gets a really bad observation, adaptability. It can get a bad connotation. Because when you think of change, what are some of the words that come to mind? Scary. Scary. Stressful. Stressful. Possibilities. Okay, possibilities, it's in there. Inevitable. Ah, oh, I wish I could change that to my staff. <laughs> I wish they knew. 
<laughs> I mean, Maureen will speak to this. And by the way, thank you, Maureen, for talking about Virginia Dear Wines today and the classes for Coco Wine. Um, we're going through a lot of turnover right now. We're, we're a company that's going through a lot of changes, and so there's some people leaving. And it's a natural course of things. No, they're not supposed to leave. That's change. It's scary, right? So, um, it's opportunity though. It's opportunity for people to move and change within the company, of course, and that person to make a really good life choice. And it's just a side story, which you'll get way too many of, I promise you. But there was a director talking to our managers and said, well, what did you think was going to happen? Do you think your supervisor is going to stay here forever? And she said, yes. <laughs> like, no, people change. What else comes to mind for change? Any other words that come to mind? Exciting. Exciting. Ah, uh, good one too. Evolving. Evolving. Opportunity. And opportunity. Opportunity. Um, I was thinking about what if someone came up to you and said, you know, I want you to have $10,000 in cash. Please. Would you say, that is too much of a change. <laughs> <laughs> I can't handle that change. It's not in the plan. We assume change, but what if someone said, I'm going to offer, I'm going to create this change for you and it's going to be good. You want evidence. What if you believed things happen for you, not to you? I can't tell you how that phrase has carried me through my life. More in retrospect, I wish I'd known it sooner. But I say at this age, I'm fortunate enough to have enough life behind me to know it works out and enough life ahead of me to apply that lesson to. And that's adaptability. So adaptability is not only a process, it's a mindset. It's an attitude. Because if you use these words for adaptability as you are using them and change, they can be positive and can be negative. And I highly recommend you absorb both. Because if we do something that we call spiritually bypassing, we go Pollyanna. If we say, no, no, I'm not scared, it's going to be great, put on a meditation tape or a self-help tape and yay, I'm great, you're missing a lot of information. And there's a lot of information in observing your own feelings about change and observing everything. So has anyone heard, or have you heard the word serendipity? Mm -hmm. By the way, doing great with your interactions. <laughs> <laughs> what does serendipity mean? When luck meets opportunity. When luck meets opportunity. Great. Meant to be. Meant to be. That's the big, I always think of serendipity as meant to be. Things happen for a reason. It's you might not know them, but they happen for a reason. Fate. <laughs> Things happen for a reason. Okay. So there is a, I don't know why I need these cards, I'm just making sure I'm not missing anything important. <laughs> it's like, I never said that. Okay, good. Um, there's this fable of serendipity. And it's actually where the word serendipity comes from. And it's from something, it's killing me, I'm not pacing, just putting cards on the table. Um, three princes of serendip is where it comes from. So a king has three sons, three princes, ready to inherit the kingdom. He felt really good about how he raised them. He gave them the wisest sages to teach them through the years. They knew everything they needed to know from books. They had a good community of people around them. He seemed pretty smart. And he said, you know what? They don't have life experience. They're not ready. I'm not sure they're ready. So I'm sending them on a journey, long road through the desert. I want them to experience different cultures. I want them to experience life. I want them to use their minds. So off they are on their long journey on this long road, and they come across a man standing on the road, looking despondent. And they say to the man, what's going on? And he says, well, I lost my camel. I can't, I can't go where I need to go without my camel. I lost my camel. It's kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say I've ever lost a camel. So my bike, but I have a camel. So um, they said, well, we've seen your camel. I said, how do you know it's my camel? There are a lot of camels out here in the desert. So, well, does your camel, is your camel blind in the right eye? Is he missing a tooth, front tooth? Is he lame? And they go, yeah, yeah, it's my camel. And he goes shooting off down the road. He saw my camel, he saw my camel. I go back, they think, great, I'm going to go get my camel. And he comes back and he's like, my camel wasn't there. Why are you guys messing with me? Why are you fooling around with me? Why did you say you saw my camel? I said, well, we did. Was your camel carrying a pregnant woman? I mean, you should have told me you had a wife on the camel, but okay. And, um, and was your camel, did, did you have honey on one side of the camel in a saddlebag? And then did you have butter on the other side? And he goes, you stole my camel. And so he, he got the three princes back in their version of prison <laughs> with the emperor. And they held them and they said, you need to confess where you took the camel. You know, it's like, 
on a horse rustling today, maybe. So um, the camel shows up. The camel was found. And they said, how did you know what the camel looked like? And they said, well, we've been out in the desert for a while. We were just paying attention to what we were looking at. And so we saw this trail. And we saw on the left side of the road, the grass was really, uh, was really trodden on, but the right side not. Which, you know, it's a desert, but okay. So, <laughs> I'm pulling the story. But we know then the, the camel's blind, the right eye. There was food dribbled on the road, missing a front tooth. And of course, the footprints, please, anyone can see there's a lame camel somewhere on the road. They said, well, what about everything else? They said, well, we saw honey on the left side. Of, I'm sorry, we saw got this flies on one side of the road, there on the honey, and ants all over the butter. And then we saw, this is a kind of funny one, we saw a blotch of urine on the side with a handprint. So we know it was a pregnant woman who had to relieve herself and had to push herself up off the road. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we knew your camel was out there. Serendipity is not just a luck. It's not some mystical force. It's paying attention to the signs. And in my mind, that's exactly what adaptability takes. It takes courage. It takes presence. It takes peace, taking the time. And it takes always paying attention. And I firmly believe we always have the ability to be working on this, to constantly, constantly be practicing those skills of adaptability and looking for the signs. I happen to work for someone, Francis Ford Coppola, who constantly teaches me this, both in present time and in retrospect. One of my favorite ways that he starts his sentence is, well, it seems to me. <laughs> well, it seems to me. So um, and I, I, do, I should come back and talk about gut instinct, too, because he follows his gut instinct, and I follow mine. I'm willing to bet you follow yours. When you follow your gut instinct, it's informed by something. So Francis also has that gut instinct, which comes up with the, it seems to me. So um, we were, our restaurant, Rustic, Francis's favorites, was going to be cooking at James Beard in New York. So we had our whole team packed up, ready to go. And I looked at the roster, we've been planning this you know, for months, and I was excited, I, was li I lived in New York for a long time, I'm going home. <laughs> I'm gonna talk faster and walk even faster, I'm so excited. And I looked at the roster, I'm like, wait, who's gonna be holding down the fort? All the leaders are going. So I bowed out. And you guys all go, I need to be here with the staff, and I'm going to take care of the property. And that night, Francis happened to come in. And he's really funny. I mean, I can go on with Francis' stories forever. He says, you know, I'm being dropped off. Do you know anyone who's going to Napa? Afterwards, they said, no. He goes, oh, I'm sure I can find a guest who will take me home. I'm like, you you're just going to, like, hello, do you like taking Francis for Coco home? <laughs> he was really going to go with that. I said, yeah, I got you covered. I'll bring you home. <laughs> And I took that time to, to just basically grill him. I had him trapped in my car. What is it? <laughs> I also go on cattle, so I see people laugh, and it's like, so you tell me you pay money to go do ranching for someone else uh, and sleep outside? I said, I do. Well, why? Because I get to learn so much. I'm not on the cattle drive with the scenery. I'm annoying the hell out of the cowboys, asking them every question I can ask about riding around with your cows. So same thing with Francis, trapped in my car. And I asked him, Francis, what, what brought you to purchase this property in this part of Sonoma County? So if you know our history, we owned, we owned Ingle Nook, which was Nibon Coppola, which was Rubicon, pick a name, that's all us. And all of our wine brands were there. And he said, you know, it doesn't make sense. Again, observing. Francis is an introvert. You wouldn't know it unless you're around him. And you realize, I guess conversation's over, and you just kind of get up and leave. <laughs> it can be a little awkward, the observing thing. But he's an observer, and he would sit at Inkle Nook and observe. And he saw the kids had nothing to do, and he couldn't stand that. He's an Italian family man. Families should like travel in packs. They should be everywhere together. And so then he brought these sailboats that they used in Central Park, and he pushed them with a stick. He put them in the fountain. But he still, he still saw that parents were uncomfortable always having to watch their kids. So he went to his, his favorite focus group, the kids, and he said, what would you like at a winery? He, they said, we'd love a swimming pool. And they said, you know, it seems to me that's a good idea. We should build a winery with a swimming pool. So all of Francis's adult advisors, 
said, very bad idea. We really don't want that. It makes no sense. I mean, how do you have a resort swimming pool winery? It hasn't been done. No reason not to do it, of course. And uh, so they started looking for property. And we needed something called a K permit. There are four of those in Sonoma County. Winery, I'm joking, of course, you've all been there many times. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. we know life orbits around our winery. <laughs> so I'm just clear. You know. So he, um, he said we looked at all these different properties. It was the furthest north. It was outside of Healdsburg. And everyone advised against it. It's in the middle of nowhere. And they also advise against making our own wine because a lot of wineries, for those in the industry, you know you sometimes bring in a portable bottling truck and do your bottling that way or farm it out. So it's a big responsibility and investment to do your own bottling. And then he said, uh, well, it seems to me, <laughs> I'm like, here we go. I love the seems to me. Because it seems to me, if we're making wine, we should actually make our own wine, don't you think? Like, how do you argue with that? And then he said, about the location, he said, yeah, we had one closer in Healdsburg that made more sense. He said, but geography changes. He said, UCLA used to be in the middle of nowhere. Now UCLA is LA. And he just has this compass, this gut instinct he trusts. So now it's easy for me to sit here and say, trust your gut instinct. Because I gotta tell you, I have done some pretty dumb things on my gut instinct. But that's not even true. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna back up on that. Because the signs are always there, too. I horseback ride. And again, I really welcome you to think about your own personal experiences, because I promise you, all your big surprises, if you took the time to rewind, you'd be like, oh, yeah. You know, that, that I saw if I paid attention. So I moved to Sonoma County, oh, gosh, 18 months ago. But I've been commuting for six, five and a half years from the East Bay. And fine, or if there was that crazy look, I'm going to ask you to trans transpose that into, oh, good for you. <laughs> Aren't you wonderful that you did that for your family? Because I did. And but I love the drive. And I, I learned so much in the drive. Anyhow, so I moved up here, and before you know it, I own a horse. Like, ah, I was not in the plan to own a horse. <laughs> and I got Hank. <laughs> Hank's pretty great. And I took him out for a ride last December. And my first cattle drive, they said to me, there are two kinds, I wish I could do a te Texan accent. There are two kinds of riders, those who have been thrown, and those that will be. So on December 28th, they changed categories. <laughs> yeah. I like, I thought, it's amazing, but has anyone been thrown from a horse? Okay. Was it a slow motion experience for you? Like, my process was, this is not Urban Cowboy. <laughs> and like, I got to make a choice. And I got I to gotta go. And so I, I released. And, um, you know, concussions, some cowgirl things like that that happened. <laughs> but, you know, the reaction was emergency room, but shock. I was really mad at him. You know, it was his fault. Definitely his fault. But it was, I put together the signs. It was funny. My daughter drove me to the hospital. Um, and she, and I had her get on the phone with the stable owner. And I said, find out right now what I did wrong. I need to know what happened there. And as I rewound the signs, all the signs were there. I could see exactly what the signs were. And so Francis is always looking for those signs, and he follows the gut instinct. But how do you know how to trust your gut instinct? I'm going to say you can support it with knowledge. So when I talked to the owner of the stables, and I got a lot of knowledge there. You can be proactive in that to supply your gut. And running your businesses, it's available to you. Besides observing, look at your data. Look at what you're recording. And are you analyzing it? I often look to our managers and say, great, we're tracking how many guests come through the door. My conversion rate, what are we doing with the information? We're going to do something about the information we're gathering. That feeds your gut instinct. Surveys. Part of adaptability is hiring. And we'll talk about leadership in a minute. But you've got to do surveys with your employees. How are they doing? If you don't want to do the surveys, it's an undertaking. But ask yourself, why not? What might you find out? You might find out you're doing great. You might find out you're not. You might find out it's a whole mixed thing. You might be afraid they're going to want changes. Oh, there's that scary word again. I can't commit to the change, right? How do we know what that is? But you've got to feed the gut. And feed the gut by reading. Read not only what's happening in your industry, what's happening everywhere in the world. And how's that going to feed into you? That's all part of feeding the gut instinct. Because here's the thing. Businesses are not adaptable. Businesses don't make changes. People make changes. People who lead the businesses lead the adaptability. They lead the charge. And there's a lot at stake. There's a lot at stake. It's a competitive market. Every market, super competitive. I have, I have um, an associate who's an art consultant. And she is scratching her head right now 
why she cannot make her business work. And then she lists all the reasons. Well, they can buy the art on the internet, they go directly to the artists, everyone's an expert nowadays. And she, guess what? How many years has she been saying this? Seven years. How adaptable is <laughs> she? She's not going to make a change. She's observing, but what are you doing with it? So as a leader, it's important to decide where you're adaptable. But here's the twist. I gave you some of the teaser too before. You've got to decide where you're not adaptable too. Where do you absolutely refuse to adapt? Do you want to work for an organization where you can't speak your mind? You choose. Some people that's really comfortable. It's like that. I don't want to, have to put myself out there. It's fine. But you choose where you adapt. And when you're hiring people, are you clear on what you're looking for? Are you clear on who you are? And are you? We didn't have a mission statement for the longest time. It drove me crazy. And I don't come from. Rebecca. You got a couple oh, seconds. Oh, good. That was my cue. I'm ahead of myself. This is good. <laughs> when I um. So I'm giving my cue. Mission statement. Mission statement. Thank you. So I joined the company. Drove me crazy. Have a mission statement, which makes this right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. No, Carol's giving me another cue. See, I told you. I said I've got a, I've got a couple of cues. Just tell me when, but be really clear. I said, but no, that if you kick me under the table, I'll just say, why are you kicking me? <laughs> and it's happening. Carol's saying she's doing this. I'm like, what? Huh? What? <laughs> Okay, thank you. I will come to that. <laughs> she gave me a clue. Um, when we talk about uh, adaptability and leading, we have to know our mission statement as well. Now, if you don't have a mission statement, I'm going to go in two directions here. There's a mission statement for your company, and there's a mission statement for you. Can you hear me if I go over here? Yeah. <coughs> thank you. Was I lighting up because it's more fun to get the light on my face? <laughs> but it hits in the right place. So. I wrote a personal mission statement, and I recommend you do too, because you have to know where you're fitting in in life. That's really important, because when you can lead, and this is a whole other talk, when you can lead from within, from a personal sense of belonging, you'll know where you're make, why you're making your choices, who you work for, what companies you start, and so on. So I'm in the business of human potential. It took me a long time just to make it that simple, but that's my business. I'm in the business of human potential. I believe in people. I believe in finding their holes and making them better. I find making them more of who they're, I love making them more of who they already are, and I love doing that for myself. It's my passion. And that translates to the business. It translates everywhere. Now, if you don't have a mission statement for your company, how many companies have a mission statement? How many people use their mission statement? How many companies do use it? That's great. That's the most important thing. So our mission, we have, the story of our mission statement, so it drove me nuts for three years when I have a mission statement. So dog with a bone, I find that like, we get the meeting together, we have an offsite with a facilitator, we pick 20 influential people from associate to bottling line person to manager and supervisor. And we spend an entire day hunkering down, writing versions of a mission statement. People leave exhilarated, they're so happy. We are forming, and finally, after all these years, a mission statement. I said, you know what, someone should probably tell Francis. <laughs> We've got a mission statement for him. Because he's not into that, he's creative, you know, it's, uh, it's operational stuff. And so we contacted Francis, and he said, huh, why don't you just use the one we have? I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, well, you know, quality, authenticity, pleasure. Like, I'm a writer, it's not really a statement, it's three words with periods after each, but okay. But I love it, because it turns out he had this personal mission statement, and we know exactly what we stand for. So when I say as a leader, know what you're willing to adapt to, what you're not. When you're hiring people, know what you're looking for, and don't falter. How many people manage people? How many people have so much fun doing that? <laughs> it depends on the day, right? And probably the person that's not working out so well is not in the right job, or they just haven't been coached, or they're not clear on what's expected of them. If you're not clear on what's expected of you, it's pretty darn hard to hold them accountable. It's very hard. So earlier I talked about observing. Somewhere in this room, there's a bag that's just a little wrong. If someone's sitting with the bag or next to the bag, what's wrong with the bag? If you find it, you gotta cry. I tell you, I'll give you a hint. It's on the outside of the bag. Did you 
find it. Come and bring it up here and show us what's wrong. Oh, it's upside down. Oh, Observe, you came in, all these bags look alike. Not so much. You get a real one now with a bottle of wine. Oh. Oh. the right people in place, exactly the right organization, as it should be. That's how it should be. That's how it is. You know, every year, really every year, I've been seven years at Coppola, I've redone the organization chart. I've redone it based on the needs. It's changed. You know, we've redone so many things. We keep reinventing. I think it's one of the reasons I love for Francis, love working for Francis and Eleanor. Continuously reinventing and always asking, one of my favorite questions is, is that true? Is that true? Another Francis story, in case you're not bored with them yet, they get pretty entertaining. Um, he con Francis contacted our winemaker years ago. So I have this great, I've got this idea. He never sells it. I've got this idea. I thought we should put sparkling wine in a small can, like a single serving can. What do you think of that? Well, it's a great responsibility to answer that question. This is a new product. So Corey did the due diligence, his diligent thing and said, Francis, I think it's a terrible idea. And I'll tell you why. We're going to have to use carbonation in a regular way of making sparkling wine. Um, no one's going to want a single serving. I'm not sure how it's going to taste and keep on the shelf. Hard to package. I think it's going to work. And Francis wrote back one sentence. Do not be the roadblock to creativity. <laughs> I love that. That's first in our organization. But he saw ahead. Guess how many companies are making canned wine right now? It's phenomenal. And can I tell you, it's one of our best sellers. And we've got other brand extensions coming out, and that's Sophia Mini. But do not be the roadblock to creativity. That's part of our interviewing process. Asking questions about adaptability is part of what we do. But is it true is a really important question. And here's another great one. We're now going into the spirits business. I know. It's exciting. It's exciting. How did that happen, you may ask? Because, gosh, we only have about 70 wines, three wineries, four resorts. Food line. In your bag, you'll see All Story Magazine. All Story Magazine is a wonderful, award-winning literary magazine that Francis produces. And but he doesn't really get every every issue is a guest artist. New paper every time they pick the paper stock. Guess how much money we make on this? Nothing. But um, it's an artistic endeavor, right? Anyhow, how do we get to the spirits business? He has a, a granddaughter, Gia. We're making wines with her brand, her name on it, and it didn't do well. He's always willing to take risks. He said, you know what? Uh, it turns out Gia is a mixologist. I forgot she's a mixologist. She'd rather make spirits. Like, well, good for Gia. We don't make spirits. <laughs> and we looked into it. Well, we can't make spirits by law. We own restaurants. They could get a monopoly on the spirits line, and so we don't, we can't do it. Francis said, seems to me we should change the law. <laughs> <laughs> so we changed the law, <laughs> and now we're making spirits. That's right. Push, push, push. But always be aware. And I just want to add in everything we do is self-expression for Francis and the family. And lucky the work I do is self-expression for myself too. Because it's not just a spirits line. Women, you're going to love this. Men, you better too. He named the great women spirits because there are too many women in history who have not been acknowledged. Yeah. That's right. Every, every label is a, fa a woman who should be famous in mathematics, arts, and science. They're going to have their name and their story in the label. I get chills with this. And it's about time. So not only is he making spirits, he's making spirits with purpose. <laughs> so there's a lot at stake with being adaptable. A lot at stake. And anyone who's a leader, i got to tell you, it's on you. It's on you. I'm not the top dog at Coppola, by any means. You can bet I'm pushing all the time. Or I'll tell you, oh, she pushes all the time. <laughs> but, <laughs> and it's true. And it's in the details. It's in the details. And start pushing and asking. 
Is it true? Is this how we have to do it? What's really happening in the market? We're the 12th largest company right now. Next year we could be 25. That's up to us to decide. Francis brought in a marketing company, a marketing people from outside the industry. He said, I don't want to do it like everyone else does because everyone else is doing it that way. How fun is that? And they're going deep into the data because they want to know how to be adaptable to what's happening in the market. Up until this point, we always had marketing people who watch and they know what's going on because they're in the wine industry. So let's get some data behind it. So she brings in these kick butt companies who come with these incredible presentations about what's really happening. And the culture's like, wow, Francis isn't going to want to hear that. Really? Because this is the man that says, it seems to me. <laughs> he wants information. So I want to just take you through a little um, visual representation of what's at stake and what can happen with great leadership and adaptability, with courage, and what can happen when you don't have it. So let's go in the corner. No more cues for me. I covered it, Carol and Megan. I'm good. <laughs> no more kicking under the table. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, one of my heroes, Richard Branson. If I ever worked for anyone else, this would be the gentleman. Talk about risk taking. You know, always, I think one of the things I should mention, the Francis and Mr. Branson both, I think create trends as well. They react to what's happening, but they're not afraid to do their own thing too, even if it's not happening. So every success story is a tale of constant adaptation, revision, and change. And again, I'm changing the org chart every single year. Adapt to what's really happening in the organization and what we need. Who remembers that store? <laughs> Blockbuster at one point was worth $5 billion. Oh, wow. I guess they didn't really pay attention. Borders? In the last years, they're losing $74 million a quarter. Not reacting to what's happening. Blinders on, not wanting to know the truth, not adapting. This was my first job. <laughs> it was? Yes. What department? I was the national, I was a trainee for them. I ran a lingerie department for three months until I bailed to go to the wine business. <laughs> ah, look, retail wine, there yeah. you go. I was in sporting goods. Oh. Scrawny six-year-old selling shotguns. <laughs> <laughs> I made the mistake of telling our associates in the tasting room that I'm not shotgun Sally, so there you go. <laughs> so sad. I mean, this was, was this telling me like of my generation, the neighborhood place. You go to Sears for everything. Not anymore. It's really sad. But the businesses didn't go under. The leaders let these companies down. They succumbed, I get mad about this, because they succumbed to some pressures that they did not have the courage to pay attention. They didn't look at the broader landscape of what's happening in the world, outside of their world, of their companies, to make some changes. And we can keep going. <laughs> Keep going. I can keep going, and I just got depressed. <laughs> I love this. The measure of intelligence is the ability to change. I'm no Einstein, but I would add the desire. The desire, the welcoming the opportunity of change, the looking for opportunities to change. Let's go to some happier stories. IBM, incredible company. I love these stories because these are the rock climbers. These are, these are courageous, courageous leaders that led these organizations. Smart, but really wanting to face what's happening. So IBM was the king of the computing world. And then the clones came. You know, made them, what the, they were the king because they farmed out all of their hardware. They had it made by other people, by other companies. And then others followed. They could just do it cheaper. So like my friend, the art consultant, you could keep doing the same thing. I wonder why it's not working. They had to make a really difficult choice, innovate or die. They were the kings. They could say, I'm, but wait, I'm king of the hill. We still do it best, everyone. <laughs> so they abandoned the business. They abandoned the PC business. That's crazy. Instead, they focused on IT expertise and computing services to businesses. I'd love to be in those board meetings about how they made that happen. And by 2010, they acquired around 200 companies in the IT services sector. And they also invested heavily in the server business. The result, by 2013, they became the number one seller of enterprise server solutions in the world. They made some tough choices, but it came from facing the truth. 
and not judging. That's where we lose it, right? Oh, we can't think we're failing, we're judging. Is that true? Let go, don't be married to the outcome. Anyone on my team will tell you, they're so tired of hearing that, but yet they're repeating it. Don't be married to the outcome. Try something, may not work. Don't be married to the outcome. But somewhere, there are signs telling you, because you're thinking about it. If you're thinking about it, that's a... Really? Rubber boots? In 1871, Nokia Ab built its first, the second paper mill in Finland. And then a neighbor, a rubber company, making rubber tires and galoshes. The third one comes along, they join forces. And they're known. I didn't know this. Did you guys know this? They're known for the clean, colorful, rubber rainbow boots. Their claim to fame. I haven't seen anyone boast in Milky Boots. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I missed that trend. I like them, I'm gonna look for them. <laughs> this is what gets me. How do you go from rubber boots to phones? <laughs> Observe the trend in electronics. So here, they're in their own industry of rubber boots. And instead of saying, we have to make better boots. Let's go to hiking boots. Let's go to heels. Let's make hats go crazy, right? They didn't do any of that. They just ditched it. Because someone was paying attention to the world. And they see what's happening. And they see the first manufacturer of car phones. They continue evolving their product through the years. This surprised me. For 14 consecutive years, they sold more cell phones than any other company in the world. Mm -hmm. What? It wasn't iPhone? Fascinating, right? Ditched their entire thing that made them famous for a century. Western Union. I used to watch I Love Lucy, and I really wanted a telegram one day. <laughs> I never got a telegram. But I did use Western Union. In 1851, they followed the trend from the beginning. They paid attention to the signs, right? In 1851, the sign was Samuel Morse sent the first telegraph, and they were on board. And at its peak, they sent out more than 200 million telegrams. Pretty solid. They should be patting themselves on the back, right? So business declined with lower cost, long distance calls than the internet. Did they fight it? Maybe in between, but it's not when they landed because they were already in the money transfer business. They already had another oar in the water. And they launched a set fax service communication satellite commercial email. They just didn't stop. They didn't just stick with one thing. Today, it's the world's largest money transfer service with more than 515,000 locations in 200 countries. Great story, too. National Geographic. Anyone have National Geographic at any point in their house? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I loved it. I'm like, then I don't really get it. But the good thing is National Geographic, so people aren't really getting this. It was published in 1888. Started to hemorrhage subscribers in the 1990s as younger readers dismissed it as their grandparents' magazine. Again, I love that they were looking at what was really happening and not trying. And this is where we make our mistake. We just try to change what's happening. You ever heard, like, how does this go? E, E. E, uh, shoot, opportunity, no, mm, it's going to come back to me. But there's an equation that you can change what's happening or you can change your reaction to what's happening. E plus R equals O, I know I get there. So the experience plus the reaction equals, equals the outcome. What do we try to change? The experience. Change the reaction to the experience and you change the outcome. We're trying to change the experience. Oh, but they should be reading the magazine, right? How did that go? I missed the rest of this. Here we go. CEO Jeff A. didn't wait around. He didn't wait around for his publication to suffer the same fate as, remember, Life magazine? Mm -hmm. Same thing, same format. Didn't adjust, didn't adapt. They reinvented it across all media platforms, including this really cool channel. Did anyone grow up or watch the National Geographic documentaries when you were younger? Yeah, I used to want that where a priest put me to sleep. <laughs> it's like, oh, God, I can read this to fall asleep. So, so, you know, look what they created in some of their documentaries. Shifted from sober nature documentaries to an eclectic mix of a reality series. And they involved their viewers on social media as well. <laughs> and to sum it up, it's not the strongest or the most intelligent who will survive but those who can best manage 
and of course I would alter it and welcome change. And that's the change that you hold and you can create. Because as much as you love what you're doing now, the world is changing, your staff is changing, pay attention to the signs, welcome the signs, dig up the signs, and then follow that gut instinct because somewhere you know what needs to be done to adapt and to grow. And there's nothing more gratifying than putting your finger on the pulse of it, making a change, and watching everything change with you. Thank you. So lovely. Thank you. That was yes. very inspiring. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so everybody, Sally's going to be around for a little bit longer. She's going to be here to connect with you all. We've got some more wine and we've got some more herbs, so everybody can mingle. And then we're going to have a raffle giveaway. We've got the Aveda Spa basket, and then we've also got the Francis Ford Coppola and Virginia Dare wines. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm I'm in marketing and I work for a financial services company and I was telling Sally earlier that like that's the most boring marketing <laughs> you can pretty much do. Um, but what we find is that you know when it comes to marketing, for example, you're kind of sort of always struggling with technology, engineers, operations, because they really rely on that well, this is the way I've done things, and this is the way things have always been done, and you're trying to change because your buyer or your audience is always changing. So what advice do you have when you encounter these situations where people are, I would say, maybe very reluctant to change? Like, what, what would you recommend? So reluctant to change the way they market? Um, yeah, or just the way they do things, the way they operate. Mm -hmm. I'm a big believer in bringing an outside company to present the facts. But at some point, they don't want to hear from their own team. Right because they feel betrayal. Like, wait, you know, that's how we do it. How can you, and an outside team is so impartial and so objective, they'll lay data out and learn so much. And if not, I would send yourself to seminars and come back with information. We recently, we recently sent our DTC, a direct consumer marketing person out to learn more about social media. And we quickly learned that when you embed a video and an email, short, 15 second, boom. I mean, and for, we just had record sales. Like we did sixty thousand dollars in one day for our wine course sales, and that's where they buy wine. Yeah, but it was a little video, just a little fun video, and inserting a, a little. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Another one is we put in a countdown, a clicker clock, of how long they have purchase and it's just a silly little thing like that but yeah I agree and, it, and again the change like but we think this is the way to do it you know but getting for me going to outside sources it's it, it, you can't argue it yeah yeah and that's what I bring into my presentations and to my team as well so um, in working with a team of people that you're managing through change mm -hmm. so you kind of brought up change <clears throat> how do you make the determination and, and coach people through discovery of whether they're going to be able to manage the change yeah. or if they're so stuck, the change they need to manage is finding all of the other amazing opportunities that exist in uh, Apple Valley. Are you an HR? <laughs> there are amazing opportunities out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I love that question. So we've had so many iterations of managers, sometimes in chunks, because the company changed. And so the one thing we did years ago is we presented, and this was a lot of change planning, people were concerned about this. One change is we had to close our Napa offices and combine them over to Sonoma County. Like, whoa, scary all the place, you know, we don't want to commute, and what does this mean? Are we a corporation now and not like this funky creative company? And there was a lot of turmoil around that, and so people left that moment was going to happen because of fear, and it's okay. Um, so we did a, a seminar, but a summer, like a workshop, showing in an organization like this hourglass of what has to happen and change. Things seem really stable, then it turns into this craziness, you know, spaghetti, and then arrows go in every direction, and then it comes out the other side. But you can't go from here to here without the middle. Yeah. And so we explain, this is just part of company change. And for some people, it's going to be uncomfortable. What was interesting 
is how uncomfortable it was for people who thrive on that energy to come out the other side. It's like, this is it? I'm just answering emails and holding meetings and doing like the status quo. So educating them on this is just how it is, things happening to you, I mean, for you and not to you, is really helpful. Does that help, or are you looking for more specifics? No, no, I think it's good. So it's like the desperation curve. There's change happening, the valley of despair, you're going to lose power, and it's really going to come out. Well, and they, and they should all be experienced. They should all be experienced. And I think it's really important that they say, you know, just experience whatever you're going through. I talk about the spiritual bypass. You don't miss the information that gives you. Because you learn a lot about yourself at one time. Like, ah, notice I'm getting really crispy right now. You know? <laughs> like, just so you're aware, that's what's going on for me without any judgment. Just working, yeah. To me, what I can offer, and I think that's what my, I think for mentioning my, my degree in integral psychology, that, I, I was saying earlier, I, I couldn't do what I do without that graduate degree because my place for this information is so much broader than just what's happening here. And I think as leaders, we owe that, especially with your education, right? you owe that to your team to bring everything you've learned here through organizational management, right? Organizational development. You bring that to your team and just it comforts them and it grows them. So you know, this is just how it is because they, they're supposed to. They don't have what you have. That's why you do what you do. My former mentor, Tracy Gelder, said, but Sally, that's why you do what you do and they don't. I'm like, uh, right. <laughs> that's why I'm here. Not to get in the story, but to lead the story. Thank you. Oh, I, just, I just had a question about, um, you mentioned that Francis uh, wanted to change the law with regard to uh, spirits and owning restaurants. And I'd love to learn more about that. It's super Yeah, it wasn't as hard as you would think. It's kind of a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not about, oh, I had a lot of money. It wasn't that at all. Plus, it's like he's <laughs> all good business in order. Oh my god, to listen to talking like, you know, I saw Stephen in George's Jets. <laughs> I'm going with the old ones. <laughs> they came in too. I'm like, you know, we're done. <laughs> so it wasn't about the money, it was about the intention. Yeah. Yeah, we could talk forever on the subject, right? Setting the intention. And he just, God, I love this. And I, it's why I work here, because it aligns with who I already am. It's like just, of course, um, human potential, right? It's just, of course it can happen. It's just a matter of how, not if, right? And so we had some lobbyists over dinner. <laughs> we should have some lobbyists over, don't you think? <laughs> 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 it's so damn simple. Why do we think so hard when he just makes it so simple? And so they did. He's like, you know, what's with that, that law? How do we have that? It doesn't make any sense that we should have that law, doesn't he? He really believes it. It occurs to me. Yeah, it occurs to me. And so, yeah, so the laws changed. And that's how, it's pretty much that was it. He hired, our, we have an in, inside attorney. He's like, well, let's see what we can do. And, and you know, I was talking about who you hire. Get rid of the naysayers. Yeah. They should go to politics. <laughs> no, no. You know, finding people who get on board. I should, I should, the caveat is you want people who challenge, constructively challenge. Like, is that true? That's not a naysayer. But like, change that law, I've got other things to do, no. Surrounding yourself with people who think like you do, there's nothing more exhilarating. I'm sure a lot of you experience that. It's like, this is like, we're the same. Diverse enough for our thinking, but we have the same compass, the same intention. Yeah. Is that your question? Yeah, I was, you used um, the word spiritual bypass. Mm. You used it again just a minute ago. Yeah. Could you, uh, could you define that? Yeah. Word so, um, and the word spiritual kind of freaks people out. We can call like intellect a bypassing that helps for MBA students. <laughs> um, so our society, Western culture in the United States, is really known for no dark emotions allowed. Just go take a medication, you know, talk your way out of it, um, get to the self-help aisle. No dark emotions allowed. They're unpleasant, almost as unpleasant as observing. <laughs> you know, and um, the Dalai Lama in one of his visits, came to the United States and said, what are you people doing? You're missing so much information. You're missing so much information in your sorrow, in your grief, in your anxiety, in your depression. That's where you do your learning. The rest is the sunshine part. You can't have sunshine without clouds. It's a cycle, right? So spiritual by bypassing, I would do like a visual on my head. <laughs> like, here's the experience. Wow, it's uncomfortable. I know I want to get here. So let's not go through. Let's go through. Oh, there we are. Now we are. 
But that's false. It's, you're teetering. You don't have anything in between. It's hollow. You know, and what's really interesting, and uh, to really go deeper into this, when you're experiencing just the dark emotion, the scary part is how do I know how long this will last? It's like a kidnapping. I don't know how long you're going to be sleeping. <laughs> you got to make you sense, right? But if you don't know, is this, am I now in a state of depression? Or am I a stage? There's a big difference, right? A stage is temporary. A stage moves you to the next level. A state is, is, is a really dense period of time. So you need that information. So to say with your staff, yeah, that change is really uncomfortable. But you want to be like, lay down, how's that feeling to you? But to really go through experience it, because it's, the crazy thing is you don't want to miss that precious pocket of time. Change, that's really a precious pocket of time. It's uncomfortable. I equate to when you go into like a high security building and you open a door and then it clicks behind you and you wait for the next one to open. That moment, <laughs> that one's locked, you can't go, and that one's locked, you can't go. That's what a dark emotion can feel like, too. You feel a little trapped and you're not certain. But when you experience it, and, and actually the term really is observe it, you go, ah, oh, isn't that interesting? That's me being really weepy. <laughs> I'm really feeling down right now. I'm really not sure if I like this. What's amazing is how quickly and purely you move through to the next level. It's that trust piece. And that's spiritual bypass is when you skip that piece and you skip the learning that comes with it. And often that dark emotion is not about the now, it's about all the story you attach to it and it goes back to something else. Another little thing I've learned is at work, and this will come in handy to you, when you're experiencing issues with yourself or with staff, people take their family and recreate them in the workplace. So have you ever had um, someone who just feels like, let's say, you're being really harsh. Oh my God, you're being really harsh. We're talking, we were talking about being direct, right? Mm -hmm. Really interesting to know maybe what their parents were like. Did they, were they so critical? Any critical word is just like a trigger. Oh, you can't fix it as an employer. But we recreate our families at work. There's just this overlay. Very little is the fear and the dark emotion. Very little has to do with what's actually happening in real time. Now, please don't go in. <laughs> everything about your family and your staff. But it's something to keep in mind for yourself, too. You know, these triggers that happen usually have very little to do with what's actually happening. But that's, again, where we do our learning. Like, isn't that interesting? That feeling's familiar. When did I last mm -hmm. feel that? Gosh, you know, I felt that when I was really betrayed in high school, actually. And so they realized, that person's actually probably just okay and busy. <laughs> They're not betraying me. It just, anyway, that's spiritual bypass. A lot of information with dark emotions, I recommend using. Yeah. I, I, I do work with in transformational leadership. And mm. I think that one of the most powerful things is resistance. Um, and it, it, people see that as wrong. Mm. But there's so, I think that, you know, you're talking about resistance within, in your people, within people. And mm. that's a powerful place to learn from. Resistance is natural, right? I mean, we come from having to survive. So you resist, you know, and and the signs are always there for that too. You know, it's like that the shoe that's rubbing against your heel and you're just too long, you can't wear shoes for the next three days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, resistance, it's, it's true. Yeah, and, and it's natural because it's uncomfortable. Anything new is uncomfortable, it should be. We have no, no frame of reference for it. Any other questions? Um, well, one of the things you mentioned is don't be married to the outcome. Yeah. How do you? reconcile that with being held to delivering results. Ah, yeah. Well, that's assuming results come one way. So can you give me an example? Uh, yeah, just an example out of the air. Just like, you know, being held to certain numbers. Um, mm. You know, mm -hmm. you have to deliver on those numbers, but, you know, you're sort of enjoying the process to getting those numbers, and, and maybe that's there's something in the strategy that might not be working, but, mm. yeah. That's a really good question. Yeah, easy to say, don't be married to the outcome, I got a budget. <laughs> right, yeah. I, have I got to a P&L and I'm really sweating. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. so I think that goes back to it's not um, if, it's how. I always believe the numbers are possible. And I'm just kind of crazy, and I really just believe it's possible. I think it's a matter of looking at it differently very often. 
So, so often we may think of the direct business about driving revenue. I don't know, is that true? Are the people who are there as productive as they could be? What if we actually add payroll instead of taking away, and we become an Apple store where you can't walk out without getting attention? What oh, would that be like? Oh, that takes a risk, and that's super duper uncomfortable, because I can control a really controllable payroll, right? So I think it's more, it's a if and how thing. And there's so many ways, I just think like the universe, there's so many ways to make money, it's ridiculous. But we get in runs. You know, what's runs? To get that tire out of that groove, mm -hmm. it takes practice, it takes conversation about it's not if, you know, it's, it's not if, it's how. You know, and there, we always hit these roadblocks. It's a small story not directly related is in our new restaurant, which you will all come to visit. It's called mm -hmm. Wearable Comico. I know, you just it rings, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> what? Okay. So we're going to say it together because it's just my cast. Wearable. I don't get to sing along as a campfire if I get to sing along as a restaurant. So wear a woe. Wear a woe. Comico. Comico. Wear a woe, Comico. And it means I. summer camp in the <laughs> It's part of the story of Virginia Dare and the heritage of Virginia Dare. Um, and it's a village, it's a whole story. It's really not about that as much as about the great cuisine. It's a fast casual restaurant. I was part of, um, and it's Native American food. So it's a bigger story, great restaurant. But, I don't mean to be, I just, I will talk for 10 minutes about the story if you let me. We were building the restaurant and Francis had this idea for a starry night sky. We had this vaulted ceiling, let's put in a starry night sky. So I was a project manager, we had the construction team, the architect, the designer, and they're talking about if we can do this, and we talked, like, probably like 30 minutes, and if we can do this, and how okay, great, it's just really difficult with this high electronics and blah, 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 and to embed in the ceiling and where we have the controls. And I just listened, and I listened, and I said, huh, that's really interesting. However, you're asking the wrong question. You're asking if, not how. There's always a way, NPS, I promise you, Francis already knows the way. He's waiting for us to get to the answer. And I say I really feel the same way with the PL. There's always a way. But it may mean being uncomfortable. Do we really need those expenses? Do we really need that event? Do we need more? There's a way to do it, but it means often thinking outside the box and where we struggle with our PLs. We want to keep doing things the same way like the art consultant and expect different results. We all know what that you know definition is. But that's, that's how I think. And, and with staffing, too, not married to the outcome. I've lost some people I just adored. Mm -hmm. But not my journey. I didn't know what their path was supposed to be. Who might think they were supposed to stay here for the rest of their lives? Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Maureen. Somebody asked what Wero Comico means. Yes, thank you. It's, uh, it means place of leadership or gathering house. That's what it means, literally? Oh. And it is. It, so it was actually, it is an actual Native American word, and that's what it means. And there was an actual Native American settlement, which is now in what's, what's now Virginia, called Werewolf Comic Con. It was like their plaza or their marketplace. Ah. And so. And hence our gathering place. Yes. Thank you, Steve. Oh, like, really? <laughs> Maureen, Maureen is one of our managers at the tasting room there. It's an actual rock And for the record, my lip sync battle. <laughs> we really rocked the other night. I'll tell you, we didn't win, but we showed up. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty great. Um, so please enjoy wines. Please come to the tasting rooms too. Um, we just really have fun putting together. Get package produced. You can enjoy your And I can't tell you what to talk about. Thank you.